Monday in Simpsonville, South Carolina, and we're in part six of the real Christmas story. Part one, we saw the announcement or the notice to Joseph. Part two, we saw the announcement or notice to Mary. Part three, we saw the announcement or notice to shepherds. Part four, we saw the shepherds' announcement to Mary and Joseph. Part five, we saw Simeon finding his lifelong promise. And tonight, we want to take a look at uh, chapter two of the book of Luke. Verses 36 and 37, we find Anna. She's uh, a prophetess. She's well up in years. 84 year old widow. Had been a widow for a long time. She served in the temple faithfully, day and night, it says. And she was a woman of prayer and fasting. And when she saw all that had happened in the temple, and when she saw what Simeon had said and what the presence of Jesus felt like in her heart, she gave thanks and continued speaking about all of this to anyone that was looking for the redemption of Israel. It's an incredible testimony when you think about it. Shouldn't we who have been saved by Jesus from our sins through his death on the cross be doing just what Anna did telling everybody anybody that's looking for redemption anybody that wants to be reconciled to God shouldn't we be telling them at this Christmas season not about Santa Claus or Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer or any of the silly fables that we tell around Christmas time but shouldn't we be telling about Jesus the redemption of man's souls well, we continue in Matthew chapter 2 as we take this story in the probable sequence of its events. Some time has passed and the Magi, the scientists, the astrologers, they come from the east to Jerusalem. Just had been foretold by Micah chapter 5 beginning at verse 2 through 4. And they were asking around town, where is he that's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star, and we've come to worship him. When Herod heard about this in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, he didn't like it very much. A king, another king, a king of the Jews, I'm the king. And so he sent for the wise men, the Magi. And he asked them where this child was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem. And he said, go search him out. Uh, wise men, go and find this child that's been born king of the Jews and then come back and report to me who he is and where he is. He wanted to know exactly when the star had been seen so he'd have some idea how old this child was now. The Magi or the wise men found that the star was guiding them now in verses 9 and 10 to the exact location of the Christ child. It wasn't in a stable or a barn it was in a house. It says so in verse 11. And that's why we know that they found Jesus sometime after the shepherds, probably by quite a bit. They came into the house and as soon as they saw the child, they fell down and worshipped him. Now I want you to notice how they worshipped him. They worshipped him with their gifts. They worshipped him out of their material possessions. Shouldn't we do the same? When the call comes for an offering for missionaries for this time of year, when our church budget is being prepared, shouldn't we give an offering for Jesus? 
In any case, the wise men fell down, the magi fell down, and they worshipped him by opening their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold suitable for a king, because he would be king of kings and lord of lords. Frankincense, which had long been used as a symbol, even all the way back to the holy place and the holy of holies in the Old Testament, symbolizing the prayers of the saints going up before God. Myrrh, often used in the preparation of a burial of a body where Jesus would die for our sins. Three gifts, but not necessarily three magi or three wise men, certainly not three kings. That's just a Christmas song. And perhaps they weren't the only gifts that were given, but they were symbolic gifts of the life of Jesus. They fell down and worshiped him and one of the ways of worshiping him is to give. And then, warned by God, they went back a different way, so as to avoid Herod. What was that prophecy told by Micah in chapter 5? Listen to these words, beginning in verse 2 of Micah. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, too little to be among the class of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. In other words, Jesus had always been. He would not only be the ruler of Israel, but it came from a long ago. Because Jesus was there at creation. That's why John 1, 1 and 14 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Creator of the heavens and the earth would go forth, it says. In verse 4 it goes on and says, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. <laughs> was in the beginning, was in the story of the birth of Jesus, and always will be to the ends of the earth. Lord of lords and king of kings, shepherding his people, his flock, in the strength of the Lord. <laughs> And he's coming again, my friends. And it seems like with all of the signs of the times, it may not be long. Wouldn't it be something if he came, even though this was really not the date of his birthday? Wouldn't it be something if he came on December 25th? Came again with a shout and a trumpet sound. And we heard the voice come up here to all of his flock, all of his sheep. Well, that's just a little bit of the Christmas story. Stay tuned and find my closing thoughts as we wrap up the Christmas story in part seven. That's your thought for the day. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.